hi everybody welcome to our webinar today our lunch and learn with I'm, i love this is one of my favorites having maureen here to answer some of our questions and have we always have awesome discussions um, i'm kristen young i'm the clinical director for heron project and i'm here today with maureen cavanaugh um, i'm going to let her introduce herself but before just a couple of housekeeping things if you are on the webinar version please put your questions at, in the q a tab at the it's at the bottom of most of our screens if you're on a tablet you might need to touch the screen to have it pop up if you are live on facebook you can put your questions right in the comment section and they will get to us so you want to introduce yourself maureen Sure. I uh, see if I remember how to do this. I feel like it's been a really it's long time wild, since we've done this. Yeah. Um, my name is Maureen Cavanaugh. I'm the founder of Magnolia New Beginnings, and I am a family work, family coach and interventionist and an educator um, working with um, Magnolia Recovery um, and Consulting Services. Awesome. I love having you on. I know. So, I love this too. <laughs> and we are taking questions. So if anybody out there has any questions, shoot them right over to us. Again, if you're on Facebook, write in the comment section. If you're on the webinar version, write in the Q&A on your screen. Um, so how have you been, Maureen? I feel like I haven't seen you in eons. I know. It's been a really, it feels like it's been a really long time. Every month, I think I texted you and I said, is it, is it, is, is it, time? is it this month? Is it this month? Um, I've been good. I feel like we're coming out of the whole COVID thing a little bit, which has been just a little bit, which has been nice, you know, getting out, starting to travel again. I um, was in North Carolina and had the opportunity to go to the Oaks. Oh, I love and the Oaks. I saw the I, pictures. And um, that was awesome. That was awesome because I had heard about it from you and I'd heard about it from Kevin and um wanted to see it and I I was out there doing other things so um I had the chance to stop by what an what an amazing program and for those of you who are watching the Oaks is a 12-step recovery program um in South Carolina they have a website it's I think if you just google the Oaks it might even be like the oaks.com but they're they're amazing they're um they have they just opened up a women's program they have a men's program it's yeah. affordable people can stay there long term the, long term that's what I love to be uh, yeah me too the woman's house is beautiful too well, it's really nice those two things affordable and long term don't typically come together in the same no. sentence <laughs> No. And you know what I really loved about it is they encouraged, um, uh, encouraged the people there to like move into the community to start working, you know, as soon as they were able when they're when the bulk of their programming uh, shifted to other times, so that they could get out there and do the transition into life, because that's what is what takes a lot of our loved ones down again is that, you know, getting back into life as as usual. And to do it in a supported environment for a year, you know, whoa, this is just like, well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because historically, when I first started in this field, I'm not going to say how long ago it was because I will age myself. Um, but it was about two decades ago. The ideas around these things were don't stress people out. They shouldn't go back to work too soon. And I feel like some of those ideas are still out there, but what studies have actually shown and what my anecdotal experience has also shown is that when people get out there and get a job and can start taking care of themselves, it improves their self-esteem, which actually yes. makes it easier for them to stay in recovery. Right. right? We're building so on successes. It, we're not like sitting and lingering in, in all the things that didn't go right. We're, we're stacking all those successes right absolutely and just as an aside this doesn't mean that they necessarily should go back to the job that they were doing before i just absolutely. want to throw that out there for those of you that get kind of stuck on that um sometimes people can't go back to the same careers because it's where they used and it's too triggering and it might be really stressful environment and all that but a job is a great thing for most of our folks to have mm -hmm. and something that they get some form of enjoyment out of and they feel productive and a reason to get out of them. So I'm glad I, I you just, brought that up. Yeah, I, I loved it. I was walking across the um seeing the men's program and this young man walked past me and I said, and he said, he's hi ma'am. And I said, hi, how are you today? He goes, I am blessed. And I was like, Aww. where am I? <laughs> People that are in like really doing recovery here are like a, the most amazing people you'll ever meet. It was great. It was really good. I enjoyed it very much, very much. So it was fun. That's so awesome. yeah, I've been starting to travel again and, and get out there and do trainings. And that's been, I, so I feel like a person again, Right. you know, 
Great. You know, I was talking this morning, I, I did um, a meeting with all of the clinicians that work for Heron Project. And one of the things we were talking about is how at this point, it seems like people are, more people are starting to move towards recovery and getting into treatment. And I'm, I'm talking in relation to like the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. Like rate, rates of alcoholism, rates of use were just skyrocketing and they seem hopefully to be leveling off a little bit and more people are starting to really get help for it. Probably at the point where it's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get help because the wheels are coming off the bus, but I'm hoping that's true. I'm hoping that we're starting to at least I hope so. see, because it's been, it's been awful. It's really hard for a lot of people. I've noticed a lot more people reaching out. Yeah. You know, it seemed like, I, you know, where, where is everybody for a while? And then now I'm seeing a lot more, a lot more families reaching out, a lot more people looking for recovery, reaching out. Yeah. Very, very happy to see that. Me too. A lot of our groups are, um, family groups are like 16, 18 people every week. That's a nice size group. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. I'm Lots not of happy to see that. Mm-hmm. I just think everybody was just worn out. Yeah. You know, for a while where they couldn't even get their head around one more, you know, bit of information. Yeah. So how, hopefully they're coming back. To, I know I've had more trainings too, a lot more trainings. So hopefully we're coming out of this, which would I be wonderful because I don't know about you, but I can't take much more of this. No, and I'm I need the sun. I'm excited to be able to go out and take a walk again without the wind in the air hurting my face. Like all of these things are good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But yeah, if for those of you out there, check out the Oaks. It's a great, great program if you're you have a loved one that's struggling or you yourself are struggling. Um and you can always get more information if you call our um our treatment line, which is all the information is up on our website. Um, it's a great, great program. I'm glad you got out there. I want to get out and see the women's program so badly. We haven't, I've seen the men's program, but never seen the women's. So I spoke at it. So, um, and, and, you know, toward it and it's like, this is nothing fancy, you know, there's nothing, no part of this where the, we're not worried about the, the thread counts on the sheets or anything like that, but it's good, solid recovery and people that are doing the work of, of getting into recovery. So Yep. And it was nice. I mean, I would be happy there. It was it, such a nice group of women. Oh my, they were amazing. Mm-hmm. Yep. I sat through a meeting there um, and they were covering step one at the time. And the speaker was just phenomenal. Yeah. So I'm, um, um, okay. We have a question. Do you think that facilities that are one sex only are stronger than co-ed? That's a great question. It's a great question. Yes. I I know how I feel. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are challenges when they're co-ed that you have to overcome for the most part. And, you know, when you think about like, I, I get, I get stuck in this because of my, I'm trying to be more fluid when it comes to my understanding of gender and sexuality and all of these things. But I do think that we're socialized to be more comfortable with our own gender for the most part, that's a stereotype, but for the most part. So I do think that there are some challenges that, um, when you're trying to be co-ed, what do, what are your thoughts on it, Maureen? I, I think that especially in early recovery and most people have experienced some kind of trauma. Yeah. So, um, I think that it's difficult to share and it's difficult to relate. Um, not impossible, right. But difficult to somebody um, who does not identify as your gender. So I would, um, I think that it's, a, it's much better to have the gender separate. Yeah. And that's very true, particularly for women. Not to say that men don't have some triggers around this stuff too. They definitely, definitely do. But particularly for women, a lot of women who, are, who have lived on the streets or, you know, they, they have some form of sexual trauma, typically at the hands of men. Um, so that is a very difficult thing for a lot of places to do. And, to and, do I think, well. and I think it would be difficult for a man to share about something like that in front of a woman. Mm-hmm. So I, I do okay. think that they, that, you know, I've seen some of the places where it's like 90% of the time they're separated or 75% of the time they're separated. But th- then the whole other thing about attraction, right? This is, should be the last thing you should be thinking of when you're in treatment is um, being, you know, how cute the guy in, in, in treatment is too, or vice versa. It's, it's not, um, 
I don't think it, I, that's like something that should be off your mind. And how can it be off your mind if you're young and there's a cute guy? <laughs> well, and it, it tends to be, and we see this a lot when you go to, if, if you've ever gone to any AA or NA meetings, particularly those for young people, they tend to be, even though the rule is you're supposed to wait a year, right? It very rarely happens. And they often tend to become dating, dating sites for people. Right. Um so, and it's, it's common for us to move from one addiction to another and love and lust and sex are all things that can become addictive and make us feel good about ourselves for short periods of time when we're not right. So there is a pull to that when you're in early recovery. Even somebody, I always use that too. And I just used it today with a family is we, even if we've never had issues with, with drugs or alcohol, as a family member, we can all relate to that guy or girl that was terrible for us and we couldn't stay away from them, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was just like, I, I don't know why, but I always seem to wind up back with him. Yeah. And I mean, we've almost, almost all of us have had that really, that really rotten relationship. So magnify that times 10 and there's your relationship with, with drugs and alcohol. And then you don't have the drugs and alcohol and you, you introduce, you know, the men and women together and exactly what you said it becomes it, it it's a very similar feeling well and let's throw out there as well like the things in my life that have caused me the most pain are relationships right absolutely in romantic relationships and it's not because of the other person this is the thing i have to talk about often with people it's because of how i feel about me so if i'm in a romantic relationship with somebody and they hurt me in some way all of my insecurities are right in front of my face right my thighs are too big i don't like my stomach i have an awful personality whatever it is that you're struggling with and these are all things that i hear in therapy regularly right they're right in front of your face that's a lot of pain so it's not actually really pain about the other person oftentimes it's the pain and how we feel about ourselves and the mirror that's put in front of our face and we need coping skills good coping skills to be able to sit in that amount of pain and move through it in the first year of recovery those coping skills are not great right? right like that's what the whole first year of recovery is allowing our brains to heal while gaining some coping strategies outside of the use of drugs and alcohol that's a lot of work so this is not where we want to have that mirror right here <laughs> when it comes to relationships, right? That come, that will come, but yeah. you're better off not having to in the moment. And you tend to attract people that are on your same kind of frequency, right? So mm -hmm. if you're all tortured and, and a mess and who's not when they're just in early recovery, I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody that wouldn't describe themselves like that. Right. That's who you're, you're drawing close to you. And that times two is just not usually a good idea. No. Um, we had no. another question and I was going to say something and it relates to that. Um, how long should you stay single in early sobriety? I always hear a year. Well, somebody just said to me, we were talking about relationships and how long should you wait for um, a relationship? Should you have, you know, some space and not date and that kind of stuff? And they said that their grandmother always said five uh, a year for every five years. So if you had a 10 year relationship, two years. And I thought to myself, that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I would answer that I, kind of in the same way. If you've had a five year relationship with drugs and alcohol, you should probably give it at least a year. Yeah. And I have know. everything that happens in a year happen mm -hmm. to you and and not have another person to kind of ease that for you. you have to work through it on your own right absolutely and again i think a lot of that too is what you just said in order for me to find the person i first have to be the person oh yeah right and this goes this is not just drugs and alcohol you guys this is human this is just humans in general and oftentimes we're looking for the person to make us or help us become that person and that never works right i wish and, i had known this a long time ago oh, <laughs> you and me both right so if you can figure your own self out and figure out what your stuff is what your triggers are work on yourself had good, good coping strategies and have a gen genuine contentment in your life the person that you're going to bring in is going to be, is, is they're going to match that, right? Like you just said. And that's where the magic happens in relationships is when we're choosing to be together, where we don't have to be together. Mm -hmm. We don't need each other, right. Right? right? There's a choice. 
So I don't, I don't know if that's a clear answer to your question, but <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of people get into relationships when they're in treatment, when they're in early recovery. And I don't know, you know, I don't know any, if anybody's ever done any research on that, but I would say it probably doesn't work more than it does. It probably causes more trouble than, than help, but every once in a while, you, you know, yeah, it works out and at least works out maybe for a while. And if people are both growing in the same direction, maybe that's when it works. But all too often you see one person take the other person out because they weren't really strong and stable enough to be with somebody and love somebody who then, you know, had a recurrence and they just went right along with them. So, yeah, absolutely. And it's sad when we see that. But there's no rules, right? I mean, there's rules, but there's no hard and fast. This is what right. happens. There's suggestions. I think that's more what we're talking about here. So if your loved one is dating and they're in their first year recovery, please don't now take this and go start to tell them that they shouldn't no. date <laughs> it all uh, over exactly. them about it. Um, keep it in the back of your head. If they come to you for advice, that's the time. But don't force this on them because all you're going to do is force them more towards dating. That's the one thing that we always have to remember. It's human nature. Somebody tells me I can't do something. That's what I want to do, right? That's yes. <laughs> that's just most of us, hopefully, until we mature enough to start to listen. But that maturation process needs to happen first. So let them kind of make their own decisions and figure it out and ask a lot of questions if they're coming to you talking about this stuff instead of statements, questions. Like, right. how do you think it's going to work if you're both trying to get sober, right? And then listen. And listen. then don't follow it up with another question. Then actually listen to what they have to say. Yeah, maybe they do have a plan. Right. You know, and I always, the addiction is a disorder of immediacy. We need everything right away. Mm -hmm. So if they've made a plan and they seem to be following it, we're going to live in sober living separately. We're going to do our own recovery. And they seem to be doing that. Right. Plus you have no control over them anyhow. None. <laughs> and any control that you're trying to assert is a false sense of control. It's actually not real. That's just what I find is the more we do that, we feel better because our anxiety goes down because we think that we've inserted this and that they're going to listen and all the, everything is going to be fine. That's when they lie to us more. Mm -hmm. And it just creates so much up and down and anxiety and all over the place. We got to learn to take a step back, which can be really hard. Right. Which Maureen knows. She wrote a whole book about it. Right. An awesome book, by the way, <laughs> about what not to do yep. <laughs> until the very end, until the very it. end. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. Many, many years. The book's called, if you love me, many years of, of doing like every wrong thing, uh, wrong is I, 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 every desperate thing, yeah. every desperate thing that was unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And, um, thinking that I had to do those things and not realizing that until I stopped acting like that, we were going to keep riding that, you know, that roller coaster. Yep. I like the rubber band theory. I don't know if I've ever actually talked about this with you, Maureen, which is shocking because I feel like we've talked about everything, but um, so, and I use this a lot with dating, but I think it can, any relationship, it, it actually can make sense. If you think about a rubber band between you and the other person, right around the two of you, and the other person is pulling away for whatever reason, if you keep coming forward, what's going to happen to the rubber band? It's never, it's never going to pull, right? The person's going to keep moving back and this is how it's going to go. But if you can stay in the same spot while they're pulling back or even better, maybe pull back a little bit yourself, right? Like not chase, not try to figure it all out. Just maybe pull back a little, give them space. What eventually happens to the rubber band? The person oh, comes I like back. that. Mm-hmm. So, and that's how it works in relationships. And if you think of this logically, whenever we're chasing, the other person's running, right? But if we can pull back and we can give it some space, especially if the person, if this is a relationship that really has substance, which most mother, child, father, child, spousal relationships do to some degree, the person's going to come back, right? So try to let them come to you more. Try to let that rubber band pull because hmm. eventually- it's going to give, and they're going to come snapping right back to you. I like that. We have a question. How can I best support my 65 year old mother who has been an alcoholic her whole life? Is there hope? Do I just give up? I'll, I'll let you take that one, Maureen. 
Well, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, how can you support that? I would say, have you asked her how you can support her? I mean, we tend not to do that. Um, we sit back and we try to figure out what you think the person needs, what will work, how we can manipulate them, how we can punish them. I mean, not out of, out of love, we do this. And we try to figure out all this stuff when it might just be that, you know, instead of coming at her, you ask, what is the best way to support you? Mm -hmm. And um, because I, you know, because I love you and I want to see you healthy and I want you to be here for a long time. And how can I support that in, in, in happening? Yeah, absolutely. I think boundaries is also an important piece in this. So moving away from dictating what she should do, even if, I mean, most of the time, what we're going to say is, mom, you need to stop drinking, right? And that's going to be our agenda. And that's going to be the topic of discussion every single time we see them, especially if alcohol has been, you're going to look around the place, you're going to try to see if you can find the bottles, right? Like this is, that's, that's the game and I get it. And I don't blame you for being there, but what actually helps is if you can allow her to make her own choices which might be she right now she wants to drink and there's not much we can do about that if that's where she is but you can you can absolutely set the boundaries about what you will accept in your presence so instead of mom you need to stop drinking it should be mom i need you not to drink when we're going to see each other i need you to you know i need you to be coherent i need you to, this is what i expect from your behavior this is what i won't accept of your behavior and then we can spend time together and what she does when she's not with you, that's her choice, right? And also letting her know, and if you ever do decide, obviously I want a sober mother and these are the reasons. And if you ever do decide that's what you want, I'm here to support you hundred percent. But until then, these are my boundaries, mm -hmm. right? And I love you regardless. And I want nothing more than for us to have a good relationship. And then when she shows up, if she shows up and she's not drunk, try to talk about other things. Try not to only make the conversation about, the disease because then they don't want to see us. Right. And I really can't say I blame them. If every time I see somebody, they want to talk about how my nutrition plan is going, I'm not going to want to see them either. Right. right? right. <laughs> I just No, it's true. It's like, we get angry. They, they drink, we get angry. They drink, we get angry. They don't drink. We're still angry. You can, right. it, that you can't do that. It has, there has to be some kind of reward for her too, when she does what you ask her to do. Right. But, you know, I also, sometimes people can't just stop. So if she's not drinking and if she shows up fairly, so relatively sober and, and can um, maintain, you know, for a couple of hours while she's there, that may be depending on how much she's drinking, that may be all she can do. Right. And that's why I said, and thank you for bringing that up behaviors. Um, I like to, when you're setting boundaries, think more of behaviors than about the actual use. Okay. Right. Like what won't, I'm not going to accept slurring of speech. I'm not going to accept any insults. I'm not going to accept any abuse. I'm not going to accept any, you know, asking for money or whatever it is that you need to set as your boundaries. It's if you can rely more on behaviors, because like Maureen said, if she just stops drinking, she could have a seizure and she could actually die. It's very dangerous. So she can't stop drinking like entirely if she's a daily drinker. So I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you just said that I'm writing it down. <laughs> it's nice i like the way you put that because that's exactly what it is it's not you know you can have two drinks before you come you can't dictate that i mean yeah. somebody who's been drinking for a really long time will wake up and have to have a drink mm -hmm. their body will have to have a drink in order to keep from you know bad things from happening yeah so. um i also want to comment on the hope part should you lose hope absolutely 150 percent not um Make sure you get a good support system for yourself because there are going to be moments where you want to lose hope and you're going to feel like you're losing hope and you need people in your corner to remind you that as long, as long as she's in the fight, there is hope. I have seen it. I know Maureen has seen it. There are people that I was starting to get nervous, like, oh my God, are they going to make it? And then all of a sudden, five years later, they're like a rock star in life and they're doing amazing. So yes, always hope. There is so much resiliency in our brain and in our bodies that it and and you never know when the person's going to get it and it really sometimes it, it seems to happen like that like they're doing the same thing they've always done and all of a sudden this time is just it and you we realize like a year later wow that was the 
they haven't been back in, they've been sober. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. My, my mother quit drinking in her fifties and had drank very, very heavily her entire life and stopped drinking in her fifties. So I, I, you know, I think it's, it's shocking sometimes like the people you least expect will, um, will be able to, for some reason, they just decide now's the time and they stop. Yeah. A lot, for a lot of people, it stops working, right? When I think about, and this is usually, I don't like the term rock bottom. I feel like it's punitive and I don't want to ever, ever punish somebody for their disease. And I don't feel like people need to lose every single thing that they have created in life in order to, um, to get sober. I like to think of it as a scale where on one side is the pain of sobriety and the other side is the pain of active use. And I always want to make sure I mention the pain of sobriety that most of your loved ones are in if they have substance use disorder is immense. So sitting sober in their own heads, having to sit with everything that they've done while they used, as well as all the issues that they had that led to the use before it, it's excruciating. And they get a reprieve from that when they're using, right? So that pain is completely removed when they're using. And then there's a whole neurological thing that happens in the brain where every time the pain comes, the brain is going to push them to move towards their substance of choice or a substance. Um, so what needs to, or what we want to see happen is that the pain of active use starts to become higher than the pain of sobriety, right? And that's going to be different for everybody right? So this is where the idea of boundaries and consequences comes in. So not punishment. We don't want to punish to throw on that pain scale because that just doesn't help. No. But what we want to do is to allow the natural things that happen as a result of their use to allow them to have to face it and fix it themselves with us walking alongside them, not like a bulldozer in front of them, taking away all of that, right? So one, um, Saving Jake by D.M. Burwell, best line ever. It's a book. She wrote a great book. Um, and in it, she learned to just say to her son, every time there was a problem that he was calling her to solve, oh man, that sucks. So what are you going to do about it? Instead of fixing it for him, she was there and she was allowing him to figure it out with her support as a, as opposed to her making the decision and telling him what to do. And in the beginning, your loved ones will say, well, that's why I called you, right? That's the ongoing joke. Like, what are you going to do about it? Well, I called you, right? Um, and that's when you have to say, well, I, I've already said, I can't, I can't do that anymore. I, I can't pay your electric bill anymore. I can't contribute to you continuing to use and live your life like this. So you got to figure this out and I'm here to help. Like, I'm here to help you figure it out, but I'm not going to write a check any longer. Right. So, and if the person's electricity goes off as because they spent their money on drugs, pain scale, right. Yeah. That's what we want to see. And it's heartbreaking. I can't even imagine having to allow your child to sit in the dark, but it, I'm telling you guys, it's, it's really sometimes what we need to do. I'm not saying don't drop groceries off every once in a while. Um, but please don't I, make it filet mignon and, <laughs> and all their favorite things and yeah. stuff like that. You know, rewarding like a rack of ramen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I, I always tell parents, especially of, of younger people, you know, measure that against safety. So we're not leaving anybody on the side of the highway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, we have to live with whatever we decide to. So, but definitely like, if you're going to drop off groceries, you drop off you know, the bare minimum and, and, you know, let them know where the nearest food pantry is. Yeah. So, yep. um, Absolutely. It's, you know, but not, uh, which I, I was guilty of that. I'm going to give, <laughs> we're going to check. She's going to go to sober living and I'm going to buy her all her favorite things as if that would like glue her to the place, you know, like as if she couldn't walk, she walked away from far more than her favorite candy bar. But I, I'm thinking that that's going to keep her in there. You know, it was just, crazy. Yeah. Crazy town. Yep. We have another question. Um, how do I help a family member deal with feelings of guilt they have because of their drug use? Mm -hmm. oh, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a I say, let them apologize. I would not hear my daughter's apologies. I and went in the beginning. I kept saying, stop. I don't want to, I don't want you to, but, and it was really because I didn't want her that, that sadness about the things that she had done, stealing things and doing, I didn't want that to drag her back down in, into, you know, her addiction. 
but I wanted her to know that, you know, all I wanted was for her to be well. And I could, I, instead of saying that, and after she apologized and after she talked about it, I would shut her down all the time because I didn't want her to feel badly, mm. but it's okay for them to feel badly. Yep. And it, and, but it's, and it's okay to hear it and then say, I forgive you. Can we move on? Mm -hmm. um, I always tell families, please lock up all your stuff, lock up your credit cards, lock up your jewelry. Do not, I didn't do it because I didn't think, well, I didn't think I had to. And then even more than that is I couldn't get my head around the fact that she would ever do anything like that. Yeah. It didn't even like, didn't even make sense. Like it didn't even seem possible, but I underestimated the power of the drugs and, um, and how desperate she would get. But what, what I did was by not locking stuff up, by not putting things away is I, by had the, giving her the code to my house, even though she wasn't living there anymore, was I was making it so that she did stuff under the influence that she'll never be able to forgive herself for. Mm -hmm. And I contributed towards that because I was healthy and knew better. You yeah. should have known better. And I want to tag along with that too and add any sorts of physical altercations. Mm -hmm. um, please call the police. And I know it, this is a heartbreaking, awful thing for most families to have to do, but your loved one is not in control of themselves. They're not in control of their actions or their minds at that point. And when they went, you know, when and if they hurt you, they then have to sober up and live with that for the rest of their lives. So you're not just protecting yourself, you're actually protecting them. And they'll be mad. Yeah. But guess what happens on the other side? Guess what happens in recovery? They thank you. They thank you. Because so they'll, they'll, they'll never forgive themselves if they do something, uh, you know, to hurt you when they're sober, when yeah. they're in recovery, that will be the thing that will keep dragging them backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as far as the guilt goes, uh, no one's ever made a change when they were comfortable. You know, that's something that we always, we, we have to remember. Right. And, it, and I always joke that I've never gone on a diet until my jeans are too tight. Right. Which is the reality of just hu human nature. I don't stop eating cake until my, I'm uncomfortable in my jeans. And that's when I go, Oh boy, I think I need to do something about this. Right. So pain in life, it's, it's a constant, it's part of it. And what they have gone through, this is their pain. It's their journey. So they have to figure out how to turn that pain into something more valuable, which is honestly what happens when we work on ourselves, right? That's what the work is. It's taking that pain and giving it value and moving through it and finding a way to turn it into something beautiful. And that's what the 12 steps do folks. Like it really is. And there's evidence on that. And there's a thousand other ways to do it. It's not just the 12 steps. There's so many different ways that you can do this um, between spiritual journeys or, um, you know, going to some of the other meetings that are out there, seeing therapists, whatever their journey is, life coaches, right? There's a bunch of different ways to do this, but just know that that guilt, you can support them in it and you can do exactly what Marie, Maureen had alluded to earlier and support them in it and forgive them for what they've done to you. But just remind them that this is, it's part of being human. We do things, we all do things, whether we use drugs or alcohol, we all do things that hurt people we love. And then we have to figure out how to overcome that and how to change and how to better ourselves. Right. It's the human condition. And don't bring it up. You know, I mean, that kind of goes without saying, but it doesn't. Sometimes we get angry and we bring up these things. Oh, yeah. There's, if you know this is a sore spot and the person truly is sorry, let it go. Let mm -hmm. it go. Yeah. One question I often have from families, which I think this is a, a good segue into is how come they haven't made amends with me? They've been sober for a year or two years and they haven't, they've made amends. They're in the 12 steps. How come they haven't made amends with me yet? Right. And I don't know if any of you out there are struggling with this, but what I've found is that the people that we hurt the most are often the hardest to make amends to. So when the amends start to come, it usually starts with almost like practicing with the people that are easier to face. So if you haven't gotten your amends yet, most likely it's because they still have work to do before they're able to confront that amount of pain. Yes. So just throwing that out there as well. 
Uh, question, I worry the things I'm doing to help them are actually hurting them, like I'm enabling them. Is there a way I can tell how much help is too much? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's the foundation of everything that Maureen and I do. <laughs> it's, it's tricky sometimes, right? But um, the difference between, and I think you've said this a million times, between supporting and enabling is when you're supporting someone, you're making it less likely or, or less comfortable for them to continue to use. And when you're enabling them, you're making it easier to, to for them to use. Yep. That's kind of it. This is not black and white. This is 100% gray. So mm -hmm. the same thing that one family might do that supporting and another family might do could be enabling. It's it, you, this is why it's so important to develop your own support system of people that understand substance use disorder that you feel comfortable with that can help you sort of figure, figure this stuff out. Right. So, um, for instance, let's say your loved one is asking you for rent. Now, if they have just come out of treatment and they're really committed and they're doing all of the things and they're in the, the right facility, whatever that may be, sober ho house, you know, whatever their transitional plan is, and they're getting a job or they've started a job, but they haven't gotten their first paycheck, giving them that leg up is supporting. Absolutely. I mean, it's making it easier to stay sober by doing that. At, with a hundred percent. If they're asking you for rent, because they just lost their job due to drug use and they aren't looking for another job and they're actively using and their life is a mess and everything's falling apart, you paying their rent, enabling. Yeah, that's definitely making it easier to continue to use, right? And the other thing is that, um, um, oh, it's gone. Wait, it was gone. <laughs> um, oh, I hate that. I know it, that drives me crazy. I was actually talking about this last night in my family group, right? And I want to throw out there too this word enabling. Okay. What drives me crazy is that this word has taken on such a negative connotation. And I know there's a, a lot of people who aren't using it anymore. Um, and I don't blame them because it's taken on like language is so important. It's taken on so much negative. So I just want to talk for a second about what this means, because for me, I don't think anybody should ever feel bad about fiercely loving and protecting their family members to this degree. This is not a negative. In my opinion, you should not feel bad about who you are because you have, you would go to the ends of the earth to help somebody you love. What I want you to do instead is to be proud of yourself that you're a fierce lover and protector, but ask yourself, is it working, right? And if the answer to that is no, then look at it and recognize that maybe you need to try a different tactic because honest to God with substance use disorder, it just doesn't help. Every other disease out there, have at it, right? Like we gotta wrap, we gotta do this. We gotta get in there. We gotta wrap ourselves around them and we can still wrap ourselves around our love around um, someone with substance use disorder. We just have to look at the behaviors, like Maureen said, that are making it easier for them to use. But please don't walk away. I see so many family members who are whipping themselves for what they have done and feeling like they've somehow failed. Please don't do that. You should not feel bad that you have done everything that you knew in that moment to try to help. You just have to ask yourself, has it worked? And yeah. if the answer to that is no, then you have to really start to change up and listen to what other people say who know or have seen what does work and try to implement some of that. I think too, you have to, every, every family, like you said, is different and you're all going to have a, a different level of tolerance for what you can live with. Mm -hmm. So I always bought, I always paid for her phone. And people would tell, oh, that's, that's enabling, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. So I, oh. I always tried to make my own decisions about these things, but I knew that I was not giving her a phone for her. I was doing it for me because I wanted her to call me. And she did. That was the deal. You call me, I'll pay for the phone. So um, could she have gotten another phone? Absolutely. I'm sure she probably had a second phone, but this was the phone that she kept in touch with me on it. And that the agreement was, was that I was going to pay for it. And I always paid for her uh, sober house the first month of sober house. And it was a strain sometimes, a big strain. And she wouldn't always stay. But the agreement was that if she was going to go through a program, go through being in a program for 28 days, I would pay for the first month of sober housing. 
did it work? No, it didn't. I mean, was it, but it, or maybe it did. Maybe that's the thing that kept her sober for a little bit longer. I have no idea, but she couldn't live with us because she was, every time she came in, she left with more than she came in with. So, and I had younger children in the house. So there was no way that she could live with us. And that was my, my way of, of living with that decision too. So um, you got to do what you can live with. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, oh. and I always, this is always my, my feeling on enabling, right. Or doing, or, or even the, the old school term codependency, right. I, I think that it's not about us changing who we are. It's about us looking for the reciprocity right? And what you want. So I'm going to go people in my life. Now, the people who will, who reciprocate, I will go above and beyond for all the time because they reciprocate. Right. So just ask yourself about this when you're doing things for your loved one, like Maureen was just saying, her daughter reciprocated. She went through the treatment program, which was what Maureen's that's what she wanted to see. So then she rewarded that with something. It wasn't just, I'm going to pay for your sober home because, you know, I, I don't know what else to do at this point and I'm scared and I'm just going to keep paying for your sober home. It was, this is my, this is what I need in return. So if you're able to do this, then I will do this. That's what I just remembered what I was going to say, because it's what you're saying. We don't reward for future behavior. If you do this, I, I, I'm going to do this so that you'll do that. It doesn't work like that. You do this and then I'll do that. That's, that's the way we reward for the behavior that we, that we're seeing the behavior that we asked for. And that's not always, I mean, there's this great temptation to say, okay, you know, you've got, and I know I've seen this. Um, I'm going to pay for your apartment. You don't want to go to sober. Okay. You want an apartment. That'll be, I'll get a lease and I'll pay for your apartment. If you promise that you will stay sober. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you a car if you promise to get a job and stay sober. No, 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 no. I mean, this is like, and a lot of times, you know, I always say, I, if you read my book, you'll, you know, I should have a sign over my head that says codependent, but I don't, I, I reject that. I was not codependent. I was parenting and I was parenting from a, a point of, I was uneducated in parenting. And when I became educated, when I understood the, the whole really understood addiction and what my options were and how I could do things differently, then I parented differently. But I was, you know, I had a young woman who I was releasing into the world because she was that age who started to um, overdose once a week, you know? So I pulled closer and that's just, that's, that's parenting. Parenting from a point of fear, yes. And also parenting without really understanding that there was something else I can do. And I searched and searched for that information. And that's why I do what I do now is because I don't want anybody to have to go through that um, uneducated because it's, it's the worst thing in the whole world. There's no guarantee that becoming educated will change the outcome. Mm -mm. Because I unfortunately learned that the only one I had any control over was me. And um, I didn't learn the secret sauce. But I was very, very fortunate that when I pulled back, and I not pulled back my love that she know, knew and heard that she was loved every single day, no matter what was going on. But when she saw that I, I was starting to get more educated and speaking to her in different ways, communicating differently and starting to take care of myself, I, there was a, some, there was some switch had flipped and she started to do the same. So I think they're related. I'm, and that on, on top of the fact that we are very, very lucky that she didn't die one of those times that she overdosed. And that's the reality. We always have to name it. I mean, and that's why as family members, we get so crazy. It's because we're literally trying to save somebody's life, somebody's life that we love. So please don't ever under, underestimate that. You know, I mean, I love it's Was it the University of Texas? Is that? University they, of Texas Tech. Yeah. Yeah. That did the study um, that Maureen had sent me where they took the, the, they scanned the brains of 
family members, somebody who had a loved one struggling with substance use disorder and the brain of the person themselves struggling with substance use disorder. And when the person was thinking about their drug of choice and when the family member was thinking about getting their loved one to treatment, the same area of the brain lit up, right? So we are literally addicted to saving our loved ones, literally. And this is all trauma. This is all PTSD, you guys. This is all trauma pathways and all that stuff because we have trauma. You cannot live through this and not end up with trauma. And I also wanted to point out when you were talking about that codependent piece, it is so tricky when you have a child, right? Because there are three terms and we miss the other two sometimes when we talk about it. There is codependence, there is interdependence, and there is dependence. When you have a child, that child is dependent on you, right? So you don't have a choice. Like this, this being is going to die unless you feed it and bathe it. Like I, you know, I'll often say when I'm working with teens or even, you know, like younger adults who are struggling with this, like maybe you should listen to this person. Cause honestly, like you're expecting them just to let go. And this is the person that taught you how to use a spoon, like, they, right? Like, that this this person is intimately tied with you and was dependent on you and kept you alive so now your 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 loved one especially if it's a child is sick so you never get to go through that normal natural process of moving from dependency to interdependence right and Maureen you have adult children now that I'm sure you went through this process with right so yeah. it's it's not for those of you out there, because I'm sure I often see in families, you have other children that you went through this process with, you know, the difference. So you're capable. You didn't create this. You're not just codependent, right? A disease process took hold of your child. And that process of moving from inter from dependence to interdependence didn't happen. It turned in turned from dependence to codependence because of a life threatening disease and you never really got to see where your child's capabilities were because the disease took that away from both of you, right? So this shouldn't be a negative thing. It's a normal process. And the term codependency was actually designed because a substance use disorder does this to most people who are in it with another human being. It wasn't actually supposed to be negative. It wasn't supposed to be a reason for us to blame ourselves. It was supposed to be like, oh, this is a normal process for this abnormal situation, right? Yeah. And I think that, you know, we, we keep rushing in because we're terrified, mm -hmm. but as we were talking about earlier, you have to build on successes, right? So you have to, and, and how can anybody have a, a success mm -hmm. if you're doing everything for them? Mm -hmm. Because then if it works out, it's well it worked out because you did it. And if it doesn't work out, well, it didn't work out because you did it. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it, they never get the opportunity to, to learn, you know, learn how to, how to deal with a failure or to build on those successes if we keep doing everything for them. Yeah. So I, it's scary sometimes to step back and, and let them take it. But that question, how is that? What are you going to do about that? Yeah. What are you going to do about that? And, and how about, I believe in you. I know you can do this. I mean, that's especially when someone's trying to figure out next steps and, and they've had a little bit of success. You want to say, you know what, look at all you've accomplished. Or even if it was a while ago, you were always able to do things like this. I believe you can do this now. Mm -hmm. Huge. That's huge. And even if that's a few weeks of sobriety, right? Like, honestly, we can't underestimate. I don't know. I am so lucky. And I do think it's just luck that I didn't end up with substance use disorder. And I don't know if I did, if I would be strong enough to overcome that because it's hard, it's hard huge. work. Yeah. So we always like being able to say, cause they're gonna be like, what have I done? I only, I've only been sober for a week and a half. No, that's huge. You've been sober for a week and a half. The amount of pain that they are sitting in every single day is so huge. And they're strong enough to sit in it and not go back to the drug or the drink. That's huge. So my, I mean, my daughter walked into some form of treatment over 40 times and people would say to me, when are you going to stop? Because she's, you know, she j used to think and say, I'm sure my, do you know how hard that is to admit that it didn't work and walk in again and to go through that detox process, which it wasn't as probably less detoxes than the 40, but um, to go into that process over and over again and try again, try again. 
oh my God, I don't think I would ever be able to do that. I really don't. I, it's just, it's, it's like, I just think she's amazing for, for how many times she tried. Yeah, that's, it is. It's, I mean, in humbling and all of that, she didn't give up. Right. And that's what I always say, like, no, don't, I don't care how many times you start, you didn't give up. You know how many times I became an expert at quitting smoking. Okay. If anybody needs tips on how to quit smoking, I'm your girl because I continued to pick it up and I had to quit so many times before I finally was successful at quitting, but I was an expert at quitting, but guess what I didn't do? I never gave up. Am I a smoker now? Mm -mm. I haven't smoked in 20 years. Right. But it took me a long time to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have one, well, one last question here and it's a good one. My brother has struggled with addiction for a long time and is now in recovery, which is awesome. I want to support him, but I'm very angry with him for what he put our family through. Any tips on how I can move past it? Oh yeah. Yep. Absolutely. That's it. Right, Maureen? Yeah. Like, it's hard. It's hard. This is like, this is, uh, there's always, and there's brothers and sisters. When I deal with the whole family, there's always one that's really angry. Mm-hmm. Yep. Always. And I think you have a right to be angry. I think that we need to validate it. I mean, this disease is awful and you probably had to sit back and watch it, watch this disease hurt people you loved, not to mention your brother who I'm sure, you know, you, you love as well and have some positive memories and what it did to him. Um, You got to do your own work. That's my only suggestion. This This is your problem. Yep. It's don't make it his problem. He's got enough problems right now. You know, there may be a time when you can, when you can, when you've worked on yourself and he's worked on himself enough that you can have a conversation about it, maybe even a mediated conversation with it, with a counselor, but, um, you know, work out your own stuff. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I often say to people will say, but I don't want to forgive them. I'm too angry. Well, forgiveness isn't really about the other person. It's more about us right? It's an awful lot of anger to carry around every single day. And it only ruins the container in which it resides. It actually isn't hurting anyone but you. So I would, we offer sibling support groups at Heron Project. They're free. They're virtual. Um, You know, you can write from your living room. It's the facilitator is awesome. Um, If you are interested in joining something like that, go right on our website and sign up for it. Um, I would say get a counselor that is well-versed in addiction. Please just don't walk into any counselor's office and think that they're going to get it. Unfortunately, it's not really a part of our training unless we make it a part of our training. So um, make sure that it's somebody that you feel safe and comfortable to work through a lot of this with. I would also tell you to learn as much as you can about substance use disorder and the disease process that takes hold. I think I've watched that help a lot of families move through this when we understand that it's actually a neurological disease. And for a lot of people, the first day was the last day they actually had a choice in it. And I don't know too many people that didn't have a first day with substances. So your brother went into this with a lot of pain. He didn't start using because he was a happy person. He started using because he was in extraordinary pain. And this gave him some relief. And it's human nature for us to want to move towards things that make us feel better. Right. So if you can learn about that and what happens there, it might help you come to a place where you can forgive a little bit easier knowing that this wasn't a choice mostly wasn't a choice for him and his brain was sick and this is all we have when it comes to our reality guys it's just what's in between our two ears so if this is sick right it it it, it's going to take a a while for us to be able to make good choices or not hurtful choices and he may he may or may not realize all that he's done but he i'm sure he got he has he has like there's a good chunk of it that he actually does know he did hurtful things and that he, you know, really um, damaged the relationship and he's aware of that. But um, I'm sure that there'll be some point where you can have that conversation, but I, it shouldn't be out of anger because we don't want to punish him. The, that won't help. It really won't. It may, won't make anybody feel any better by, by, you know, just blurting it all out and, and as a punishment. If you're talking about it to try to get closer again, that's a different story. Right. Yep. And, and I, and don't feel guilty though, because I know I went through this with my ex-husband and I was so angry, so angry for so, so long. Um, But it definitely feels better on the other side of it, the forgiveness part and understanding and knowing that we're all humans and 
at the time he was doing the best that he could. I genuinely do believe that most people are doing the very best they can, they can with what they have available to them every yeah. single day, you know, and I, I don't, your brother certainly didn't set out to hurt anyone. None of your loved ones set out. That was not on their agenda, even though it feels like they were intentionally trying to hurt people. That was not the case at all. They were actually just trying to survive. So anything else, Maureen? I don't think so. No, this has been good. Lots of good questions. Really good questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was good to see you. Good to see you as well. And I will see you in a couple of months couple of months. Yep. And um, just so everybody out there is aware, we do, I do this the first Tuesday of every month at noon. Um, and Maureen comes on every third, is it, it's every third month. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So Maureen will be on again in three months from now. So thank you everyone for joining us today. This was awesome. And we'll see you next time.